Good morning. It'll help to put it in the right spot, huh, Josiah? There we go. Very thankful for all the help and the volunteers that we have. Thankful for my two sons up there that are helping out as well. Thank you guys very, very much. There we go. So um, just uh, one more announcement to make, and it's good to have uh, Patrick here. Patrick travels all over the country via a semi-truck, so it's he used to attend our church several years ago, but good to have him. He's coming through on his way to Michigan, and so good to have Patrick here and the rest of you here uh, as well. One more announcement. Obviously, we're having to make adjustments as, as it goes comes along, I guess. So on your giving, on the way out, there's some offering plates there. There's a black box. You can put your offering in there as well. For those that, we have to get all the technology together. And so uh, for those that are watching, uh, you guys can give also online, uh, legacyclovis.com. And there's a PayPal there. And uh, you can always send it to the church as well, 622 North Main here in Clovis. So. Thank you again. So there's a lot that's on my heart. Last week, I think what happened is I prepared a three-hour message, and I tried to do it in 30 minutes, and it didn't happen. It didn't even get close to happening. And so uh, scratch that preparation. So today I prepared for about 45 minutes, and I'm going to try to share it within that time period. If if you have to leave, uh, feel free, Um, because there's just a lot on my heart. I don't try to preach message for the sake of preaching a message i really want uh, a word in season for you something that that will encourage you but hopefully also to give you uh, some understanding of the days that we are living in is everything good to go there sarah okay so uh, we're going to start off in haggai and uh, then we're going to end up in haggai but we're going to start that's a book that's like kind of towards the i guess end of your old testament you gotta you might have to look it up in your um, table of contents, or if you anymore, you know, you don't turn to the page, you turn on your Bible, and that's fine too if you have it on your phone or whatever device you, you want to use. I would encourage you to follow along. We also have it up here as well. And so in Haggai, I've, I have been meditating on this book for a while. It's only two chapters, so it's not very, very long. Um, but what's interesting is it starts off talking to Old Testament believers, if you will. Believers in the sense that uh, they believed in the coming Messiah, they were part of the Abrahamic covenant, and yet being believers, they didn't know the time and the seasons that they were living in. But I have to tell you that they probably knew their Old Testament Bible more than we know our New Testament Bible. So we're not talking about people that were so distant from God, but what happened is they became so preoccupied with their day-to-day affairs And my concern is in America that maybe we've kind of gotten into the same place, that we can be believers and followers of Christ, but still not know the days and the times and the seasons that we're living in. And so you can believe in God, but still not know the season and the time that you are living in. And what's interesting is in order for you to know the purposes of God, And the plans of God, you have to know the season that you are living in. Because if you miss the season, you'll miss the purpose. And I think we are living in a generation that we long for identity. That's why we want people to like our photo and like our Instagram and like what we tweet and like our YouTube account and like our family photo and all the things that we are looking for and our in our quotes and our statements and our jokes and whatever it is that you're putting and you're posting. And I think at the root of a lot of things in our own life, we're still struggling to find out who we are. I mean, it's one thing to be 19 and still trying to figure it out, been there, done that, you know, be in your 20s and still trying to figure it out. But I'm talking about for the people that are in your 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and you're still trying to figure out your own identity. And somewhere along the way, we miss the times and the seasons, so we miss the purpose of God. And that's what he's saying in the book of Haggai. He's saying that you, you miss the season, therefore you miss the purpose of God. And so today I want to talk about the times and the seasons so you can understand the purpose, the intent of what God is wanting to do. 
It would be as if you come into this room and everybody is well and nobody is sick and we're all doing well and there's, there's no sickness, there's no ailment, there's nothing going wrong with anybody's body. But for me to preach about healing and you think, what's well, a good message, but it doesn't apply to anyone here. And maybe through the last 10 or 15 years, we've been preaching messages to a crowd that really that's not where they're living in because we really miss the plans and the purpose of God and the, and the times and the seasons that we're living in. So God says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to cause wind to blow, and I'm going to shake it all up, and I'm going to bring a famine. It's going to be a drought. That's what he's telling the people in the book of Haggai, to get your attention, because you're so busy building your own house. And so he says, I'm going to send this, and it's going to so cause you to come to a place of attention so that you can hear the times and the seasons you're living in. And so God comes, and he brings this drought to them. And then what happens, all of a sudden, in 21 days, there's this incredible turnaround. Uh, The the, the governor, uh, Zerubbabel, he hears the voice of the Lord through this prophet Haggai. It gets the governor's attention. Wouldn't that be amazing if the governor of New Mexico got a prophetic word from a true prophet and God spoke directly to her and it caught her attention? Or the governor of Texas, or the governor of Colorado, or the governor of California, the governors across the United States. That's what happened. Zerubbabel, it caught his attention. But not just him. It wasn't just in the, in the um, political uh, arena, but it was also in the religious arena. It was the high priest. Uh, Joshua, it caught his attention as well. But it didn't stop there. It caught the remnants of teach, attention. The people of God, it caught their attention. And so they had a, now a hearing ear to hear what God was speaking. And then like that, obedience is what caused everything to turn around. There was a drought, and it's all of a sudden people just obeyed the word of the Lord, and everything turned around. Wouldn't that be incredible that, let's just say, in the land and in, in the nations, that whatever amount of people, 20% of the people were disobedient, not disobedience in the sense of how we often think. We think, well, somebody's gone back to drugs or somebody's gone back to their old way of living, and we say, well, they're disobedient. But maybe you've been disobedient to a heavenly vision, to something that God spoke over your life years ago, and you haven't, you haven't pursued that. It, can I just really get so real and say maybe where we're at is we've been disobedient to even reaching people. We've, never, we, we've been serving Christ for 20 years and never having shared our faith, not even with a living person on this planet. And maybe that's the disobedience that we've been in. And so would it be an incredible thing that if, if everything we're experiencing from the racism all across and, and people that are rioting and, and they're saying all this is happening and then from this COVID-19 and, and all the things, it's like this incredible shaking has come to the land. But what if all of a sudden it was a turnaround because the people of God just says, this said, I want to hear from God. I, I want to make a recommitment in my heart to the things in, of God, to the plans and purposes of God. And then like that, everything changed in a day. There was no more virus. All of a sudden, people started loving one another. Wouldn't that be an incredible moment? And that's what happens to Haggai. It's just this incredible turnaround. And God says, this is what's going to happen. In Haggai chapter 2 and verse number 6, it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the capital D, desire of all nations. That's speaking of Jesus. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And look at verse number 15. And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. I struck you with blight and mildew and hell and all labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day, of the ninth month from that day, the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it. Then he says these words, is the seed still in the barn? That is the question, and that is what I want to share this morning. Is the seed 
still in the barn. The King James says, is the, st- is the seed yet in the barn? What does that mean? I mean, Pastor David, I'm not a farmer. I'm not in agriculture. I mean, that doesn't even apply. No, seed, I mean, I don't even have a barn. How does that apply to me? Is the seed still in the barn? See, in the entire Bible, in both the Old and the New Testament, there is an unfolding, if you will, of two seeds from the very beginning. If you really want to look at the Bible anyway, from any perspective, it is looking at it as two seeds that are growing side by side from the very beginning of the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And there are seeds that are at war with one another. And the more you study your Bible, the more you'll realize that there really are only two kinds of people on this planet. You can get back past all the skin color, all that. You can get way past that. And really, there's only two types of people on this planet. It's either the saved or the unsaved, the redeemed or the unredeemed. Children of light, children of darkness. Those that are godly, those that are ungodly, the spirit of truth, the spirit of error, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Satan, life, death, Christ, the spirit of Antichrist. It's just different words, but it's the same thing. There's still two seeds, two that are at war with each other. In 1 John chapter 4, and you can just write these and just follow me so I don't have to slow down. I can just kind of go through these. You can write these down, and my notes are always available. But in 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 2, he gives us these different uh, descriptions of two seeds. And he says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 2, it says, But you, by this you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. He says, this is what most of us hear. You've heard that it's coming, that the spirit of Antichrist is coming. And he tells us 2,000 years ago, it's already in the world. And then he says, you are from God, little children, and overcome them, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And then he says, but they are from the world. Two different kinds of seeds. Therefore, they speak as from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Jesus described it this way in the book of Matthew, chapter number 13. When describing the two types of seed, he said there's the wheat and there's the tares. The wheat and the tares. Look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 36. It says, Then Jesus left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. And will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So what he's saying is, when you read the parable, it's this sower that goes out to sow the seed. And some falls on various kinds of ground. And what he's saying is that in the midst of all that, there were tares that were growing right as the wheat was growing. 
But there was going to come a time, and it was going to be as you got closer to the end of this age, there was going to be a clear separation between the wheat and the tares because there's a certain point early on where these two seeds are growing side by side that you can't, you can't tell the difference between the wheat and the tares. But there's going to come a point where it's a very clear distinction between the two. And the angels are the ones during harvest season that there's going to be a clear distinction of harvest time and seed time. So let me give you just a very, very simple example of this. So for the last 6,000 years, you see the, the wheat and the tares growing side by side. So the wind of God, the breath of God, in Hebrew is this word ruach, ruach. It's the breath of God. And so with Abraham and Sarah, as a very simple example, before they were Abram, before they were Abraham and Sarah, his name was Abram and her name was Sarai. But the difference was, is when God blew his breath upon them, it changed their nature. And so it added the letters A-H, if you will, to their names. So Abraham, Abram became Abra, Ruach, the breath of God, he became Abraham. So the breath of God was breathed upon him. And Sarai became Sarah ah, with the ah, or the breath or the Ruach of God. That's the Ruach HaKodesh, the holy breath of God, the Holy Spirit of God. So we've seen wheat and tares growing side by side. So in the Bible, there's many names that we see with the letters A-H or the letter A. So my son is here, Josiah. He has that A-H in his name. It is part of the breath of God that you see in the Old Testament, Josiah. You have Jeremiah, you have Obadiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah. You can see these various names in the Bible. Hannah that had that, the breath of God in their name. But growing alongside of them, because people say, well, in history, I mean, they, these, some of these religions are, are just as old or older than Christianity. They're older. You find them way back thousands of years ago because the wheat and the tares are always going to grow side by side. So you have Buddha, you have Allah. It has this same kind of sound that people think, well, which one is of God and which one isn't? You have one of the Hindu gods, Krishna. That you see them growing side by side throughout the centuries. They're growing side by side because there's only two types of people on this planet and there's only two kinds of seeds. So from the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15, he gives us this incredible prophetic word of the seeds. Look at Genesis 3.15. It says this. It says, and I will put, this is a prophecy that is uh, coming to Adam and to Eve. And he's speaking specifically to, to Eve. And he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. Now look, yours should be capitalized, the, the second seed, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. From the very beginning, there's two opposing seeds. The problem is a woman doesn't have a seed, so how in the world will this prophecy come to pass? So it's going to come from a virgin womb. And so it's a prophecy, the seed is is Jesus, that is the coming seed, but the other seed is these children of darkness, and it's going to be a perpetual, continual war that's going to be happening, and if the Lord doesn't come in my lifetime, it's going to be another generation that's going to have to fight the good fight of faith. So from Genesis to the book of, of Malachi, the whole Old Testament, all, it's all about prophecies about a coming seed. And that seed is Jesus, that the seed is coming. And so one generation began to prophesy to the next generation and declare his mighty deeds. And they, they passed it from generation to generation. And as it began to unfold, this prophecy, it starts off that there's this, these two seeds that are going to be at war with one another. And then we start getting more clarity that the seed is going to be born from a virgin. And so Isaiah prophesies and lets us know. Another prophet says, He's going to be born in Bethlehem. And so now the seed, it's all this anticipation that the seed is coming. 
or in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we call it the Gospels, the seed came, but the seed dies. And so it was about the coming seed, and the seed was going to come, and the seed came, and now the seed dies. But in the book of Acts, it's about how the seed lives. And he lives through the people of God, and he lives in the church, and he lives through you and I. And then in the book of Romans, all the way to the book of Jude, the seed speaks. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1 says, God, who at the King James says sundry times, it's various times, in the various ways spoken the time past to the fathers by the prophets, but he says in these days, these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So now Jesus speaks directly to us because the seed speaks. And then in the book of Revelation, the seed reigns. So Jesus tells us about this parable of these of this good seed, if you will, and it's being now sown into the ground. Well, the seed is the word of God. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 3. Matthew 13, 3 says this, Then Jesus spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Verse number 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. He's going to explain what we just read. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that was, which was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred fold, some sixty, and some thirty. In First Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, and then I'll, I'll expound, expound a little bit of what we just read. First Peter 1, 23 says, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God which lives and abides forever. The war of these seeds. So these last 2,000 years, this, this good seed has fallen on different kinds of ground. But those that have received the word that were at that, that point in their life, they received the gospel message, and they said, I want, I, with a wholehearted devotion, I'm seeking God, I want, I want everything, I want your forgiveness, uh, everything you have for me, I receive. He says that produces 100 in some cases, some 60, some 30 fold. So Jesus, the seed was coming. And it would be like the Lord that he was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means anytime you see the word Beth in the Bible, it's house. So it's the house of bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the true bread. I am the living bread. All this was a prophecy about the seed, and the seed was coming. See, Jesus, the Bible says, was in the bosom of the Father. But at the right time, God sent his Son So he's born in the house of bread. In John chapter 1, it talks about how this word was made flesh, flesh and blood, wrapped in human skin, if you will. And it says, and he dwelt among us. The word dwelt is the word tabernacle. He 
be tabernacled among us. That's going to be very significant. So how do you know then the difference between the two whenever things are happening and the, 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 the wheat and the tares are growing side by side? Well, Jesus said one way they'll know is they'll know by your love, how you love one another. You know what all this thing that's happening in our world, you know what it really is? It's people that are longing for what the church should provide. It's the peace of God. It's having the life of God, the peace, the joy. That's what they're really longing for. He says, so they're growing side by side. So John the Baptist was put in prison and he began to question the very one that he prophesied, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He began to question his own words. Is this the Christ? Is this the Messiah? So he goes and he sends some of his disciples while he's in prison. He says, go to Jesus. And he says, he's going to ask, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus' response is the question, is the answer to the question of so many hearts. He says this, in response to that, he says, go back and tell John in John chapter 11, verse number 5. He says, go tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind see, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. This is how you'll know, and this is how I will know that the seed has come. So what about us? Pastor David, what, what do you, I mean, what's the point, right? What's the point of all, everything you just said, what's the point? Is there still seed in the barn? That's what Haggai is asking the question. If I have the incorruptible seed in my heart, what have I done with that seed? What have I done with my Christianity? What have I done with my walk with God? What kind of light have I been to my children, to my, the people I, that are, around my life. I mean, when they look at me, do they, do they see Christ? I mean, am I just preaching a message and then I go and live a different way of living and with my family, with my family, uh, the members of my family, my ex the extension of my family? Do I treat my brother and sister differently? Do I treat their children differently? I mean, do I live one way and preach this and I'm completely living a whole different message? Is there still seed in the barn? Can I tell you something? That maybe in the church, our treasures and our hearts have been misplaced. In other words, we have proclaimed the right declaration, and that is that Jesus Christ is Lord, but maybe we've preached it in the wrong location. Maybe we've just preached it solely in a building, and, and out there, there there's, there's, there's no, no message being heard out there. So yesterday I was at uh, the mall, I was at JCPenney, and as I was leaving, there's a lady that works there and, and that I know, and so we started talking. And she said, I've been wanting to tell you this, this for a while. So I had this dream, and in this dream she said it was this beautiful, there was this like beautiful mountains, and it was all lush, and it was green. And she said, she said Jesus was sitting on a rock. And she said, I went to him, and she said, I just told him, I'm going to tell everyone I know about you. And she said, he just smiled at me. And that was the extent of the dream. Now, if you know her, she does that. She shares the gospel message. She shares her faith. What about you? What about your life? Is there still seed in the barn? What have you done? When God prospered you and blessed you, I was part of that, of the, the message of, of prosperity. And, and, and those are godly principles where you learn how to claim the promises of God and those are incredible principles. What have you done with it to reach the lost? Are you just building a bigger barn to put more of your seed in? Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse number 15. Luke 12, 15 says this, Then Jesus said to them, Beware and be on guard, be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even one for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. 
And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, Well, this is what I'll do. I'll just tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Is there still seed in the barn? That's what he tells Haggai. What's interesting is that in the book of Haggai, we just read it at the very beginning. And he says, at this time of the month, this is happening. And then this date, this time of the month, this is happening. But when you study those times and seasons, it's about the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus came and he tabernacled among us. Let me just briefly explain what a tabernacle was. What they would do is this feast, there were seven feasts, now I'm not going to cover all that, but now when you get to the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh feast, it's also known as the Feast of Trumpets, they would take a, a, it was also known as the Feast of of Booths, a booth, okay, kind of like you have a fair, out in the fair, there's there's a booth that you can go and you can get information about whatever. Well, this booth was a temporary housing So in other words, they would have their permanent homes, but then at this certain time of the year for a certain amount of days, and they were were called days of awe, it was a time to get back to God. It was a time to, if you were distant from God, it was time to, to, to reconnect. If you had made a commitment 10 years ago to God, but you forgot your commitment, but he didn't forget it, it's during this time that you got out of what was the comfort of your home and you went to and you built a little booth and a place, a temporary place for you to dwell, a temporary place for you to live. It's very short, just a short, so many days, that was it. So whenever he comes to Haggai, he says this to them, you've built these beautiful houses. Man, I just love your house. I love the way you've done the decor. It's beautiful. Man, I love the carpet. Man, I love the way you, you match that tile. Man, it's just beautiful. Oh, I love what you did with, with, with the bathroom, and I, I love your living room, and it's just beautiful. But at the very end, he says, but there's, is there still seed in the barn? Have you just built, it's more than, I'm not talking about earthly possessions. Please look past that. That's not what I'm talking about. Scratch that. What I'm saying is, have you become so preoccupied with other things that you have neglected the kingdom message, the kingdom of the gospel of Christ, that the lame walk, that the blind see, that the gospel is preached to the poor? Have you gotten so busy that typically your, your, your thing is to, you drive up to Walmart, you park your car, you're not gonna talk to anybody, you're gonna go, you're gonna get your things, you're gonna get back in your vehicle and you're gonna leave. Has that been your life? Are you too busy to see the, the Samaritan woman that is there? Where Jesus said, I must go through Samaria? Are you just putting more seed in your barn? Is it about another message that Pastor David preaches or somebody else that you love to hear? And it's just like you're getting these nuggets and you just keep, you, you have so much of a library, but someone's going to build a bigger barn so I can get more. And maybe through all that, God is saying, I'm going to shake the nations. And it's going to be such an incredible shaking because you don't realize you've been so preoccupied with all these other things. There's so much seed in your barn. And you didn't even realize this whole time there's been a war between two seeds. And these two seeds have been growing side by side. And the seed came. And the seed died. And the seed speaks, but he speaks to you and he speaks through you. The Bible says, how will they hear unless there's somebody that's preaching the gospel? Unless somebody is proclaiming because you have the incorruptible seed on the inside of you. What would it be like? I, I, I love prophetic ministry. What would it be like if we went and I was out in the community and I just heard the voice of his spirit uh, to a woman or to a man that was there at the mall and I just 
felt to just go up to them and say, you know, I was, I, I was just kind of passing it. Just, I just felt like I'm supposed to share these words with you. And what if what I shared was exactly what they needed? And maybe what I shared was something that nobody else knew, that it just caught their attention. The, the message of the deaf hearing and the lame walking. Until the, he said, until they all come to the desire of all nations. What season are we in? Because if you don't know the season, you'll never know the purpose. You'll miss God. When Jesus came to his own, the Bible says he came to his own, to his own planet, to his own people. And his own people, they didn't even recognize him. He's walking in their midst. They did not even recognize him. They kept trying to put a label, well, maybe this is Joseph's son. Isn't he, isn't he from Nazareth? I mean, what prophecies has he fulfilled? They didn't even recognize him. And Jesus, during the time of tabernacles, there's a couple of things that happens during the season of tabernacles, and I believe we are in that season. Number one, books are open. And I believe God is opening up the books. He's opening up the word of God to anybody that is hungry and says, I want more of you. The books are being open. More revelation and insight of the scriptures of the word of God. But the second thing is during tabernacles is the Bible says that Jesus, he was there as if he was there secretly. He was in their midst. So what if this whole time you've been saying, Jesus, I, okay, if you're real, then why don't you show up? Maybe he was sitting right next to you the whole time. Maybe he's been speaking to you all along. And maybe he's been in the place that you thought he wasn't even there. Maybe he's heard every conversation you've ever had. And every time you ever felt abandoned and every, every wrong that was ever done, you said, God, where were you? And maybe you've had the wrong conclusion because maybe he was there all along. See, the Feast of Tabernacles is that he took on human skin and he tabernacled among us. He says, I'm taking a temporary dwelling and I'm going to go not in just in the synagogues. I'm going to go into the streets. And what God is doing in this day and age, he's shaking up the church to get us out of these four walls and really bring about a street revival. So the grain that you have is to go forth to share the gospel, to live the gospel, to be like Charlene that says, I'll tell everyone about you. And she does. She does. What would your life look like if you said, Pastor David, I'm, I'm just going to throw some things out there. What if you, your time was limited? What if you had 30 days to live? How would you, how would you change it? You know, I, was a, I was a hospice chaplain for a while. And I was at the, in order to be on hospice, a person had to have been uh, diagnosed with, with something that, that was given, they were given six months or less to live. And so I was at the end of a lot of people's lives. That's where I was. I would meet them. And when we talked, it was, it was all about relationships. It was about their children. It was about their parents. It was about their brothers, it was about their sisters, it was about reconciling, it was about hurt. It was about, I, I remember talking with a guy from here, but he, well, he lived here, but his family was in California. He hadn't even seen his children in 20 years. And so here I am trying to make phone calls for him so that I could try to reconnect him to his sons that he hadn't talked to in 20 years. And I remember he just said he felt like he had done so much damage and, and drugs had just gotten such a hold of his life. And he was a young man probably in his late 40s, and at the end of his life, what were the things that were important? So you got to live this life that, no, we used to sing this when I was a child, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. This, that's all we're doing, just passing through. How would you live your life? Would you just go and get more grain? Just got to build a bigger barn. Is there yet seed in the barn? This morning, I want to pray with you. If you can stand, I want to pray for you. And then, Sarah, I'll have you however you want to end it this morning. (laughs) 
See, there can be no harvest while the seed is still in the barn. Psalms 2.8 says, Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. The nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. When was the last time you asked for the nations? I'm talking more than China and in, in North Korea and Iraq and Iran and, and these nations that come to our mind. You know the word nation is the word that we get ethnic group. Ethnos, ethnic group. When was the last time you prayed for those that are close to you? And if you're praying for them, praise God, continue to pray for them. But don't give up on them. Don't say, well, you know, Pastor David, I tried that for five years, and you know what? He didn't change. Maybe he gave up too soon. Maybe God was doing something in his heart. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations. Praise God. Sarah, why don't you go ahead and close us out in prayer here?